This is a production of Cornell University. That worked. I want to say right off the bat that the project I'm presenting today has been a super collaborative effort between Tony's program, John Lothi, who's in entomology, somewhere, hi John, and Alan Taylor, who's a seed technologist. Alan is hosting the Cornell Seed Conference today in Geneva, which is going really well so far. The project is aimed at increasing biodiversity on farms. So I'm going to share like one slide about why we're trying to do that, then several slides about how we're trying to do that, and a little bit of pilot data. Points about biodiversity. The first is that biodiversity, of course, exists at multiple trophic levels, which tend to influence each other. Notably, increasing the biodiversity of plant species can also increase the diversity of other things such as insects or microbes. Point number two, biodiversity is associated with the provision of lots of what we call ecosystem services, or sometimes disservices. If you'll forgive a super hand wavy explanation for this, the idea is roughly this. If you have a system that's characterized by high species diversity, odds are it also has functional diversity. Lots of different organisms doing lots of different things, and some of these things are relevant to us from an agronomic or environmental perspective. The third point I wanted to make here is that there are, of course, a billion ways to increase diversity on farms. Lots of folks here are intimately familiar with many of these. Lots of approaches to increasing biodiversity have to do with either increasing the spatial and temporal diversity of crops or of non crops research is focused on the non-crop side of things. And that's the case for the project I'm sharing today, which is focused on the establishment of flower strips in agroecosystems. Now, there are lots of words for this practice. By flower strips, I'm referring to an area of the farm, often along the field margin or in a fallow area, that's not planted with crops, but instead planted with sort of beneficial non-crop species. The flower bit of the flower strip is that at least part of the goal should be to provide floral resources, nectar and pollen, to beneficial insects, but there could absolutely be other goals as well. Because all plants do multiple things, flower strips have numerous benefits. That said, three of the best characterized are pollination, biological control, and conservation. Side. If a flower strip establishes successfully, it does create flowers, that's likely to increase the abundance and diversity of insect pollinators, often yielding substantial benefits for insect pollinated crops. Crops that we think of as largely wind pollinated, soybean is a good example, can get a yield boost if there are a lot of insect pollinators around. On the biological control side, the idea is that. If you have a lot of support for natural enemies of crop pests, you're less likely to have really damaging pest outbreaks. This sort of conservation biological control, biological control through habitat manipulation, is a key component of lots of integrated pest management strategies and is only becoming more important in the context of climate change or increasing pest invasions. Lastly, one more plug for conservation because flower strips are a really great tool for them. A lot of what there is to love about them is their precision. You can choose the location and density and species composition of these strips, so they can be tailored quite specifically to support particular plant or insect species that you're trying to convert serve. These benefits are pretty awesome. And there's also substantial subsidy support available from entities like the USDA NRCS. That said, flower strips in New York or elsewhere. They do exist, don't get me wrong, but the practice is underutilized. There are a couple of reasons for this, probably, but a few that I think show up again and again in the literature and in our conversations with a diverse group of folks. 
One problem is that in this part of the world, flower strips are supposed to be established either in the fall or the spring, often around the time of the first frost or the last frost. The year, even more than other parts of the year, growers are busy and frequently just don't have time for an extra field operation. Another issue is that in an ideal world, these strips would probably be established with specialized equipment, something like a native seed drill. That's because lots of beneficial non-crop seeds are small or irregular or otherwise hard to plant. It's possible to plant flower strips in other ways, for instance, by just sort of broadcasting them over the field area, but that sometimes leads to poor establishment. So flower strips established this way might work out well, or they might be a bad return for the grower's time and money. The purpose of our project is to try to alleviate some of these challenges through the development of a new technology. Technology multi-seed zea pellet, MSVP. The concept here is that if non-crop plants can be agglomerated or molded into pellets that are the size and shape of a crop seed, then that new pellet can then be planted with the crop planter that the grower already owns, and in fact already has out in the field. So this method would be faster, cheaper, and quicker, and also more effective than existing methods of establishing flower strips. To work on developing this, we've needed a study system. And we've chosen to work on molding common milkweed seeds into the shape of a corn seed. Corn seed, hence zea pellet. We picked common milkweed because the disappearance of milkweed plants from agroecosystems, largely associated with the advent of herbicide tolerant crops since the late 90s, is thought to be one of the major drivers, or the major driver, depending on who you ask, of the last over the same time period. Monarchs were in fact just added to the IUCN endangered species list. So there's sort of a unique opportunity to engage growers in the conservation of this gorgeous and iconic insect. There's one. This next slide is a method figure about how we make the MSVP, these pellets that are shaped like hot seeds. In the first image, I think I've labeled it part A, the top row is corn seeds on a one millimeter grid. The next one is milkweed seeds. And then that bottom row is milkweed seeds that have been de winged. That is, we've removed the sort of outer wing like portion of the pericarp to make it easier to fit them in the pellets. The next step in this process is to mix up a sort of dough composed of inert filler and binder material. The fillers are diatomaceous earth and wood flour, and the binder is maltodextrin, a sort of glue. So we mix them up into a dough. It's like somewhere between bread dough and silly putty, something like that. And then we press it into these 3D printed molds that have the dimensions of crop seeds. We also add milky seeds, usually about three of them, into the molds. We bake the whole thing, and the result is this pellet that the size, shape, and density of a corn seed. In addition, the pellet is sturdy enough to go through a corn planter without crumbling and it dissolves when planted in soil so that the milkweed seedlings can emerge. The simultaneous accomplishment of all of these things is kind of the big win here. And it reflects an enormous amount of work on the part of Alan Taylor's team. Okay, so what do we do? We've done a variety of greenhouse and laboratory and outdoor pot experiments on these, but for the sake of time and coherence, I'm just going to chat about one of them. The purpose of this experiment is to test two factors. First, we wanted to know whether agglomerating milkweed seeds into these seed pellets inhibited their germination or growth at all. We wanted to know how milkweed seedlings behave when growing together. That's because often we're putting multiple seeds into a single pellet, so multiple seedlings come out, and then there's some potential for, for intraspecific competition. The multiple seedlings growing together dimension of this project is also interesting sort of from an entomology perspective. One thing I've learned over the course of this project is that monarch larvae eat more than you would think, like a lot. And they also tend to wander around from the plants in which they were born. So 
from a modern productivity perspective, it's a good thing if you can have a high density of milkweed plants available to increase the likelihood that these wandering monarchs will continue to find the food they need. To test these two factors, the agglomeration bit and the seedling density bit, we used a completely randomized design with seven treatments. In five of the treatments, we planted unpelleted seeds, what we're calling free seeds. There was a cluster of one to five free seeds in the center of each pot. In the remaining two treatments, we planted MSCP. One MSCP contained in each pot, and the MCP contained either three or five milkweed seeds. We had 10 replicates and we collected data on emergence, growth, and biomass. Roughly, the experiment looks like this. These photos were taken shortly after emergence, and they showed that whether we planted a cluster of free seeds or an MSCP containing several seeds, we got several milkweed seedlings that grew close together. We used those little colored bands to tell them apart. These are some percentage emergence data. So looking at that third column, these data are presented as mean plus or minus standard error. And importantly, this is on a per seed basis. So looking at a treatment in which three seeds were planted, percentage emergence of 67% would indicate that on average, two out of the three seedlings emerged. Yeah? So there's no significant effect of treatment here. Neither the free seed versus MSCP thing nor the seeding density thing affected percentage emergence. Likewise, there's no effect on time to emergence. Maybe numerically delayed a bit with the MSCP, but it's not statistically significant. Plant height data. Here we do have a significant effect of treatment. Plants in some treatments, notably the light green one free seed treatment, that is, we planted a single seed in these pots, grew faster. On the under, other end of the spectrum, plant height increased most slowly in the F4 and F5 treatments in the dark blue. So these are treatments in which we planted four or five free seeds. This is best explained as a difference of intraspecific competition. It's easier to get tall when you have fewer neighbors. Specifically, I think this is mostly competition for water. There is no evidence that agglomerating the seeds into MSCP had any effect on the height trajectory. So no evidence that this seedling method somehow damaged the seeds or changed their development. On a side note, take a look at the y-axis here. So we dutifully stared at these plants every day for about three months. And at the end of this, they'd achieved a grand total of about 12 centimeters. These are definitely a slow growing perennial type of plant which is why they need some help to reestablish an agroecosystem, and also why we're not super concerned about them behaving as weeds in systems that are frequently disturbed. All right, moving on to plant biomass. So in these figures, the black bars go upward and they represent above ground biomass. And the gray bars go downward and they represent below ground, that root biomass. Biomass as a total across all the seedlings in a pot. The treatments had no effects on biomass. On the right, in part B, we're looking at biomass by the number of live plants in the pot at the time of harvest. So, this is sort of the combined effect of the treatments and the emergence and any mortality that occurred. Again, no effect on the above ground biomass. However, below ground biomass for the pot tended to be greater when there were more live plants in the pot. Now the bottom row here is going to be biomass per plant. Treatment did have an effect on below ground biomass. And the number of live plants affected both above ground and below ground biomass per plant. Generally speaking, plants with fewer neighbors grew bigger presumably because they had more access to resources. Again, this is a pretty typical effect of intraspecific competition, but there's no evidence that agglomeration into MSCP did anything at all. 
functionally, it seems like a cluster of three free seeds is the same thing as an MSCP that contains three seeds, and a cluster of five free seeds is the same thing as an MSCP with five. That's the main thing I want to share here, but I'll quickly note that we did see monarch larvae in all treatments, and all treatments exhibited evidence of herbivory. Because this is a single array of plots, it's not actually the right way to assess monarch preference or performance, but this is early evidence that agglomeration into the MSCP does not somehow inhibit or deter monarchs from laying their eggs or eating the milkweed plants. Conclusions. So we have developed this new technology, which we're calling multi-seed via pellets, MSCP. It's intended to increase agroecosystem biodiversity by making it more efficient to establish these flower strips. In the experiment shared today and several others, we've seen no evidence that agglomeration into MSCP inhibits emergence from two centimeters depth, growth, or monarch productivity. So we're looking towards scale up now. We're hoping to pursue field trials in spring 2023. We're also hoping to introduce a wider variety of non tree crop species into the system. To me, a lot of the promise of this technology lies in its potential to support really a diverse array of species that we might want to introduce into agroecosystems. Ultimately, growers could choose tailored seed synthesis that would be site specific to achieve their ecological goals. I want to reiterate that this is very much the collective effort of Alan and his team members, Matthew and Michael, in addition to John and Tony. We're also so grateful for those who have helped with the molding and with the experiments and for multi-state funding. I would love to chat. I don't know if we're doing questions now or later, but I'm also available to talk anytime. Thank you so much. Why don't we take a couple of questions while you know you might still have those fresh in your minds, and then we'll go to the next our next speaker, Kara, and we can certainly come back to questions if people have more. So, any question, and if you could repeat that for those on Zoom, that would be good. I can do that. Questions? Yes, please. So it's probably premature, but any sense of like the shelf life of these molded seeds? How long could they be stored? This is a question for Alan, basically, but at least a couple of months and potentially much longer. We haven't seen any evidence that they lose stability. In particular, we've been stratifying the seeds about two weeks at four degrees Celsius before placing them into the MSCP. And it appears that once the seeds are stratified, you know, once we've broken that dormancy and gotten them ready to germinate, they do stay that, which is promising from a distribution standpoint. I did not repeat the question. I, I'm not good at following injunction. And <laughs> yeah, uh, So it seems like you have this in mind, but given that uh, the milkweed grows pretty slowly, what are your concerns about it being basically outcompeted by uh, a crop like corn, which grows quite tall and is shaded out? Absolutely. So the question is what are the concerns about milkweed being outcompeted by a crop like corn? And I think to some extent that it depends on where it would be planted. Like I often envision these strips as being planted along cornfields, so they'd be less in direct competition with the crops and perhaps more in competition with weeds. That is in itself, you know, a pretty major issue. Something like a first year mowing at perhaps 10 centimeters would help a lot, especially if these strips were intended to be maintained for a period of about three years. It's also absolutely possible to use this technology to do something like plant a low density of milkweed seedlings among corn plants. That's unlikely to reduce crop yields given the relative growth trajectories of corn and milkweed. I have done an experiment on their competition and the takeaway was basically they don't compete. Corn is a much, much, much larger plants. I think that one might have to boost the seeding density of the milkweed to some extent. However, one promising thing here is that monarchs are really quite good at seeking out milkweed and using whatever is available. There is some really interesting literature on the fact that even if there's a low density of very small milkweed plants in corn or soybean fields, 
the monarchs will find them pretty successfully. So that's potentially promising as well. I hope that was helpful at all, a bit rambly. Great, I think we'll, we'll stop there so that we can get to your uh, events. Uh, let's thank Sophie again. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.